this is our webinar webinar series. We're, we're trying to add value to the community. We're trying to talk about relevant topics in light of COVID-19 and all the stress that people are enduring. So we're so happy to have Amy Shonoff. She's done great things for Warriors Ascent. Most of you that have been through the program have familiarity with uh, Amy. Those that don't, you're in for a rare treat. It's going to be awesome. Oh. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're so glad to have you. Thanks so much for coming. And uh, Amy, thanks so much for presiding over this this block of instruction here. Now that said, I'm I really am going to try to shut up now. Um, the floor is yours, Amy. Okay. Present. Away. Uh, we've got a poll or two polls that uh, you know we'll, we'll tee up just to kind of get a sense of how you're integrating mindfulness in your lives and what you want out of this. And then, as always, we'll have a uh, a survey at the end. You know, quality control and stuff. And lastly. Amy's been nice enough to uh, provide a handout to you. You should have that in your handouts tab. It's where you sent mindful communication PDF. So if you're looking to take notes or, oh, hey, let me get this down, you've got the handout. So really just, we want your undivided attention. With that, Amy, it's yours. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mike. It's a pleasure to be in your presence. Um, and Mike will be, um, interjecting from time to time as I go along, just if there are chat questions that come up that are relevant in the moment of me presenting, he may interrupt to not interrupt, interject to provide, um, to share your questions. So please make use of the chat. Um, if you do have your microphone on, I would ask that you have it off. Um, we did have a, um, a webinar recently where um, somebody had their microphone on and it really distracted somebody else. Um, who was attending. So um, just try to be sensitive to making sure your microphone's off unless you're specifically asking a question, okay? Um, but primarily, please use the chat box for your questions. And then um, at the end or at perhaps moments where if somebody's asked a question that needs refinement in terms of us understanding it a little bit better, there may be opportunity for you to chime in as well, okay? Um, let's see. As we go through this presentation, I'd like you to consider, like, in terms of what brought you here this evening for um, this webinar in particular, to try to identify, like, one particular communication struggle that you're having, whether that's in a particular relationship or a particular area of dialogue where you're challenged. Um, where you feel like you, you want to do a better job or you want to understand better or gain some skills. Um, see if you can hold that that one relationship or that one area in your mind as we kind of go through this webinar as a way for you to really maybe dig in internally to like to inquire a little bit more as we kind of go through what mindful, mindful communication is and how it might be relevant to this one area of your life, okay? Um, and try to pick something that isn't too um, overwhelmingly charged for you. Okay, we don't want to we don't want to jump into the deep end of the pool, so to say. Okay, so we're here to just provide some introductory information on mindful communication, um, and it and it is sometimes helpful to have a particular challenge in mind as we kind of go through this intro um, in terms of how what we're sharing relates to how your dealing with a certain area of your life, okay? Um, let's see, so over the course of our time together, we'll talk about what mindfulness is, we'll talk about you know, components of communication, what mindful communication is, and some steps for bringing greater mindfulness into our communication. Um, we'll also talk about some kind of nuances that you might wanna consider um, in relationship to what we learned tonight, and there'll be some resources for you at the end to consider as well. Um, so, and we will we will do one uh, short grounding activity uh, over the course of our time together. We'll we'll do a little bit of practice on a uh, learning how to ground ourselves and keep our attention in the present moment that we can use specifically in the moments when we may be in challenging dialogue. So there will be that as well. So to introduce myself, um, as Mike said, my name is Amy Zoshonhoff, and I'm the founder of Mindfulness in the Heartland. Uh, my professional training is in mindfulness-based stress reduction 
and that's training I've received through the through the um, University of Massachusetts Medical School and Brown University Center for Mindfulness. Um, I I've been practicing mindfulness since my early 20s, and it has been um, a real anchor for my life in terms of helping me kind of navigate living and um, I would say living more fully and um, you know appreciating my life a little bit more. I, I really feel like when I um, was taught the skills of mindfulness, um, it was at a really critical juncture in my life as a young adult, and it really kind of changed the direction or the course of my life. And I truly believe in the practices that I teach because I have seen them work within my own life. And I do believe cultivating greater awareness is both a form of empowerment for us um, because it gives us choice where perhaps we haven't felt like we've had it in the past. And it also helps us to um, heal and to grow as human beings. So um, I am a cheerleader for mindfulness and uh, the powers of mindfulness. And hopefully that will be translated as um, I talk with you all this evening. So without further ado, I'm going to attempt to share my screen and Mike, I'm gonna just need you to thumbs up me when you know where I am and if I'm doing it properly. Um, that's not where I intend to be. Hold on. Give me just a second here. I don't know why my presentation isn't where it's supposed to be. There we go, okay. So can you see my screen now, Mike? Yes, indeed. It looks good. Everyone else, can you see Amy's screen? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Excellent. Okay. Shall we so, do it? So, no. <laughs> let's get rolling here, Mike. Um, so let's just, first I just want to talk about this image in relationship to mindful communication. Because mindful communication is really about one, building bridges, okay? So we're really trying to build bridges of connection through our communication. And also the other thing I like about this image, image is um, the stillness of the water. Um, that, you know, we're trying to remain, we're trying to maintain a sense of calmness and composure when we're engaging in dialogue with other people. So there's this sense of both stability and bridge building, okay? And I just wanted to bring kind of both of those metaphors kind of to the forefront as we begin this dialogue. And this idea of also of seeing both sides, you know, reflective, the reflectiveness of the water. So let's first talk about like what mindfulness is. So mindfulness is about being aware of what's happening in the present moment in a balanced and non-reactive way. So when we're being mindful, we're being in the present moment, but we're also being in the present moment with a sense of openness and acceptance about what's happening. So we're not trying to uh, push away what's happening in the present moment, both in terms of what's happening externally in our out, outer environment, but also in terms of what's happening internally. So there's the sense of um, being open and aware of our experience and being really receptive and accepting of what's whatever's happening in that present moment. Now, Mike, I think this is the moment when you wanted to bring in that poll. So Mike has a poll that he wants to share with you all. You wanna go ahead and do that, Mike? So the question is, do you integrate mindfulness practices into your daily life at this time? All right, let's give it a cup. Let's give it about a minute. We've okay, should six. I just go on? Yeah, just just keep going. And what once everyone votes, I'll uh, I'll invite everyone's attention to it. Okay, thank you. So let me get back. Okay, so what mindfulness really helps us to do is to create some space between our conditioned responses and gives us some room to actually or our reactivity. It gives us an opportunity to be less reactive. So rather than moving into habits or knee-jerk reactions, we're actually able to slow down enough to be more responsive. So is this the results of the poll? Yep. Okay, okay. 
So some of you are, a little bit less than half are, are using mindfulness in your daily lives and most of you are not. Okay, well, that's good to know. Okay, so good gravy. Excuse me here. Okay, so mindfulness is a way of us moving out of being reactive and being locked into our habits of communication and learning how to be more responsive. So what mindfulness gives us the ability to do is actually to pause, notice what's happening, and then make choices about how we're going to respond. So it gives us a great deal of potential freedom and also choice. And that can be whether we're talking about what's happening in our daily lives, but it's also within the realm of mindful communication, how we communicate with one another, okay? So mindfulness really gives us um, the opportunity to be more thoughtful and composed in terms of when we're in um, communication with other people. So mindful communication brings awareness and choice into the process of dialogue so that we can move away from these old habits that many of us walk around with that really limit understanding, both in terms of why we're doing what we're doing or why we do lean into the things that we do when we're in communication, but also developing greater understanding for the person on the other side of the conversation. And there's really th three kind of pillars that mindfulness rests upon. One is this idea of intention, so being aware of what we're being driven by in the moment, so recognizing what's motivating us, um, when we're learning how to be more mindful in our communication, we're learning how to be more aligned with our value system. So really aligning ourselves with our authenticity, what's true for us, um, and really bringing that to the forefront of our engagements with people. And you can kind of think about it as intention as kind of the bumps along the sides of the road when you're driving that tell you when you're moving out of your lane. When you have clarity around your intentions and how you want to engage with people and how you want to be in the world, when you start kind of moving out of that space, out of those values that you walk around with, it, your intentions can help you notice that and bring you back. So it's about keeping us on track in terms of how we want to say, how we say we want to be in the world. So having some ideas about, you know, how do I want to be in relationship to other people in that particular area of our lives? You know, like where you might be having struggles. Like, how do you want to feel about yourself? How do you want that person to feel about you, about themselves? You know, what, what kind of understanding do you want to help cultivate and foster in that relationship? What do you want it to look like? And what are you bringing to the table to make that a possibility? So intention is one of these kind of foundational pillars that we um, anchor into when we're cultivating mindfulness or mindful communication. Additionally, we're learning how to pay greater attention, whether we're talking about mindfulness or mindful communication. We're learning how to use our lens of attention to hone in on how we're showing up, how we're feeling, you know, whatever feelings and emotions may be present, how we feel in our bodies, noticing our thoughts, like learning how to direct and maintain our attention is one of kind of the cornerstones of mindfulness. And that's one of the things that we're learning how to cultivate when we're learning how to be mindful. And then finally, this idea of attitude, um, this idea of being more open and receptive, of moving away from the judgments that we hold, um, the, the way we often um, think things should be versus how they are, how we kind of push up against the way things are and should on whatever's happening um, in terms of laying our judgments and perceptions about the way things should be, um, how we should be, how other people should be behaving, and rather, holding an open and receptive attitude to what's happening. And then the question becomes, and then how do I work with this? Okay. So it's not about being passive when we're in communication with people, but to limit our resistance to what's happening. And then the question becomes, how do I become more skillful at responding in a way that meets my needs, 
meets the other person's needs, you know, is more collaborative in nature. So we're really trying to bring a more open and receptive attitude to communication when we're being more mindful about it, okay? So, you know, communication is really the primary vehicle that we all use as human beings to get our uh, needs met. It's how we communicate our beliefs and our perceptions of the way things are. Um, and communication is not just the words we speak, right? Communication is the tone of voice. It's the way we carry our bodies as we're talking. Uh, so communication isn't just about language. It's also about intonation, and it's also about how we hold and carry ourselves as we're communicating with other people. And to a great extent, how, how we are as communicators in terms of the ways in which we communicate are highly conditioned, you know? We learn how to communicate in our families of origin, you know? We, and, and the habits we pick up as children are often the ones that linger with us throughout our adult lives. And especially if we're not really attending to how we communicate, a lot of times the way in which we communicate is based on our family dynamics. So, you know, how our families communicated, um, cultural ways that we communicate in terms of cultural beliefs that we may hold or values that we hold based on the culture that we come from, um, and our society at large. You know, that we learn, I mean, I can even think about that in relationship to gender. You know, women and men are often taught different ways, styles of communication um, that may limit, you know, how we are able to interact um, and engage with people. So um, I think it's really important in relationship to um, challenges that we may be facing. So once again, looking at, um, a, an area of challenge that you might have in your communication to consider like, you know, what do I bring of my history into this area of my life where I'm struggling in how I'm communicating or the person I'm communicating with? What are things, what are habits that I may have or conditioning that may, that I may have gotten in my upbringing or in my community or in my culture? or in, my, in, in our society at large that are influencing how the dynamics of this uh, relationship are going. So it's important to keep that in mind as well, is what do we all already carry? And what are our kind of knee-jerk habits? What are the things that we typically lean into? So we all have communication styles. We all have ways of communicating with other people. And there's kind of, three primary communication styles that I want to point to here and what they might look like. And in relationship to, um, you know, this area of your life that may have brought you here this evening, you may want to look at like, what is the communication style that I walk around with? So for example, a passive communication style, usually the person is holding some sort of belief about the other person mattering more than what matters to me, right? So we hold this place of making the other person's opinions, feelings, beliefs greater than our own. And the strategy behind that is that I must give in in conflict, that for some reason, the needs of that individual aren't as important as the needs of the other person. And oftentimes, I think a lot of times with a passive approach to communication, there's usually some history of, um, not being, not having our needs met, you know, that aren't, there's messaging that many of us are, have received about our needs not being important, okay? And often people who have a more passive communication style, they feel helpless, they feel resentful, um, they don't feel appreciated, and, and in many ways it's because their needs don't get met, you know? But a lot of times it's because they're not asking for their needs to be met. They're, make, they're making sure the other person's needs are met, but they're not considering their own. Now for the aggressive communication style, it's the reverse. It's my feelings matter here. What's important to me matters here. And what's important to you does not. It's a very, um, it's, it's very self-centered approach to communication. And people who are more aggressive in their style of communication, it's more about battle. 
you know, that communication is more about winning. It's more about being on top and making sure that whatever I have to say uh, gets expressed and whatever needs I have get, get met. Like that, that becomes the primary kind of modus operandi as they're in communication with other people. And people who have a more aggressive communication style are usually a, a bit more, lean more into being angry and impatient. Uh, they don't have a lot of time for other people's feelings, obviously. Um, and and it's, it's really focused on the other person. Um, whereas with an assertive, with an assertive uh, style of communication, I don't know why I just lost that, there we go. Um, it's about equality. It's about both people within the communication having their needs met. It's about both people having opinions, having feelings, and having needs, and all of that being available and open to that individual. And they feel free to speak their own needs, and they can also listen to the needs of the other person. And it's more about collaboration, okay? Um, and typically, people who are more assertive in their communication style feel better about themselves. They feel like they care about other people. They feel some self-respect. They feel more confident and, and that they're being helpful, you know, that it's not just about them. So when we're talking about mindful communication, I think it's probably pretty obvious that we really want to be, whether we're, we tend to be more passive or more aggressive or a mix, depending on where we are, what we're trying to do is align ourselves more with an assertive style of communication. Um, and you may, as you think about your own life, find that there are areas where you may be more passive in your communication and areas where you may be more aggressive. Um, one of the reasons I became interested in mindful communication was um, because of um, struggles I was having uh, in my communication with my children. I mean, that's really what kind of brought this area of attention to my mindfulness practice was because I was noticing as a parent that I was incredibly unnecessarily aggressive verbally with my kids. And it was really starting to impact the relationship that I had with them. Um, and for me, it was about unlearning some really old styles of communication that I had been raised with. Um, I came from a a family environment where people yelled and screamed and um, some people got their way and it was very much about some people's needs and not others. Um, and, and so I've had to, you know, really look at my own communication in my own life to become more flexible in my relationship and how I communicate with my children. So do know that as I'm talking about these things, I, I am talking from a place of having had to work on these things myself as a human being, and all of us do to some extent. I mean, we're none of us are perfect communicators. So do keep that in mind. Amy, but do just take a moment. Ask, yes, just, go ahead. Just two questions I want to invite your attention to. So one, and I won't name names, you know, that way, you know, people can remain, remain anonymous if they want, but, uh, I cannot seem to get across the importance of personal accountability during this pandemic without getting angry. So mm. I'm sure not to speak for the person, but we see people doing irresponsible things. And I know I've observed that my wife has, and you get annoyed. So that there's that. And I would assume it's like, okay, how do you deal with that? Or how do you communicate your, your discontent and displeasure without jumping off the handle. Another one is, is it normal to go from passive and aggressive all day? I can go back and forth between the two pretty rapidly. Mm, in the same conversation? Apparently, I don't know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. okay. Hmm. Okay. So to address the first one, um, in terms of, you know, feeling that aggressiveness show up, especially in relationship to what people are doing and what you feel they should be doing. Um, I think one of the things we start to bring to the table is um, some sense of understanding what might be happening for other people. Um, I think for some people, um, that denial is is the their coping mechanism for this pandemic like that there are a certain uh, percentage of the population who just truly don't want to believe that it is what it is and 
And not that that makes their behavior right, but that might be what's showing up. That might be how it's showing up. Um, and and so, you know, developing some compassion for the, the observable behavior and knowing that there may be other things underneath it that you're not seeing. Like what you're seeing is the behavior. And I think when we're talking about um, our own safety, we definitely have the right to draw boundaries about what's acceptable and what isn't in terms of um, whether people are wearing masks, whether people are washing their hands, whether they're following the advice of social distancing. I mean, that is a place where we can assert, like, this is my need. Like, I'm taking this seriously, and I would anticipate that you are going to keep a, a good proximity of distance from me, that you are not going to try to shake my hand, you know, that we can reinforce those boundaries and be assertive. But I think it's also important to recognize that what shows up as behavior isn't necessarily um, what it might appear to be. That I think that there's a certain amount of people who their fear response, because I do think these people are still genuinely afraid, but what their fear response might be is just denial. It might be. Nonetheless, we always have the right within our bubble to say what, what our expectations are. Does that make sense? Without becoming aggressive. Mike? Um, that was Matt. Do you, you, did you get your question answered? Which Matt? Well, I actually, I actually think that was mine. My okay. it's Kelly. Kelly, um, all right. Because I am a registered nurse and working with cancer patients and their families and dealing with all this, and I find that I'm getting so angry that I'm I'm wanting people to truly sign a waiver saying, okay, I'm not going to put you on a ventilator. You know, if you're going to be stupid about this and you're taking these risks, then you're not going to need the equipment or use the equipment that we have available for those that are trying. Right, right. Well, I, and I understand, like, I think in terms of the feeling, like, your feeling is legitimate. Like, to me, that's a legitimate feeling to have. It's the question of, in the moment when the rubber hits the road, when you need to be in communication with somebody who's doing that, that you can be firm and kind. You know what I mean? So yeah. the fact that you the fact that you feel anger is an is a natural human response, right? So I'm not trying to tell you not to be angry. Like to feel anger. The question is when push comes to shove and you need to communicate about it, you can be assertive and say clearly where your boundaries are around how people show up and behave. But right. that can be done in a way that's skillful, that we can hold that feeling. I mean, this is the thing that as human beings, we're learning how to work with having really strong feelings and not moving into aggressive responses. And, and, and what mindfulness is really teaching us how to do is notice that, notice, boy, I am pissed. I am really pissed watching these people not do the things that they need to be doing to keep us all safe, right? I mean, that's right. what I hear you. I feel that too. I totally feel that. Um, well, the question is, how do we meet that in a way that's kind but firm? Well, my fear is that coming from the backgrounds that we all have come from um, and things that we have going on is... I'm starting to find myself feeling like I just want to walk into an ICU unit, get exposed to the COVID-19 and see what happens and go from there. That that's how angry I'm truly getting. And how is, I guess I don't understand how that's going to help anything. How is that going to help you? How will that help you? I guess it would, I feel like then I'll either get it over with. Either you're going to make it or you're not. You're going to build the antibodies or you're not, and it'll be done for me, and I can keep moving and not okay. worry about someone 
infecting me or me infecting my patients. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, we can't, con uh, at the end of the day, we can't control other people's behavior. And what we can do is stay right here, right now. You know, what you're getting caught up in is, is what may happen. And that's where mindfulness, once again, can help you is bringing you back to what can I do right now in terms of what I need to be communicating and also what I need to be doing to keep myself safe. And knowing that, you know, there are no guarantees. There's, there, we cannot control other people's behavior. We can let people know what we need, right? But we cannot, we can't control the future. We can't control whether we're going to get exposed to it or not. We can take pr protective measures to limit those possibilities. But right. we can't control what's going to happen. So work with what you know. Right. And stay here. Stay here right now. Yes. I'm trying. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. I mean, that's, that's the work. That's the practice. That's, that's why we learn these skills, so we can do that better. And, and, and this really speaks to something else that I think a lot of people, and I'm just going to digress a little bit here, but I think it, I'm hoping it will be helpful. Um, so when we are in spaces of great uncertainty, which is where we are right now, and quite frankly, we're always living in a space of uncertainty, but it feels more heightened right now right? We're all living with not knowing what a month from now is going to look like or two months from now is going to look like. And you combine that fear with that uncertainty and there's a great possibility that what it will lead to is panic, you know, the, the, and we see this, you know, we see this in the context of people's behaviors, um, like with regard to purchasing toilet paper, you know, like the fact that we ran out of toilet paper because people bought up all the toilet paper, you know, I mean, that's an example of panic or the stock market just tanking, you know, that's panic. And that's when people are looking into a future that they can't really see. And there's nothing really to anchor in there. There's nothing we know for certain, right? It's all unknown, but our mind loves to plan. That's its kind of inclination. The thing we have to keep in mind is we need to stay closer to what's right here, right now, and what is known. What are the things I know? What are the things I know to protect myself right now? What are the boundaries that I need to establish within my professional practice, within my personal practice, to keep myself safe? What decisions do I need to make today to take care of myself? Those, if we stay close to the information that is at hand and we make decisions based on what is known, we're liable to make better choices because that future out there really will depend on how we show up right now, each and every one of us, both individually and collectively. That future is not certain. What's more certain is what's right in front of us. So if we can anchor more of ourselves in what's here right now, what I know, my facts, the information I have, and make decisions based on that, I'm more likely to be accurate than if I make decisions based on what's out there in that uncertainty, because there's no anchor there, right? And that future, in large part, will be determined by how each of us shows up between now and then. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. I know this is hard. I know this is hard, especially in your line of work. And I imagine it's incredibly frustrating. And I just wanna acknowledge all that, that all those feelings are very natural and normal. That fear is very natural and normal but let it not consume you because it's based in things that are not known, you know? And when we talk about communication, when we put it in the context of communication, um, we are absolutely within our right 
to put guidelines about how we're going to operate in this current situation, both professionally and personally. What's acceptable? But honestly, the feelings are legitimate. You don't have to push that away. It's how do I work with these feelings? Okay. If everybody's okay with me moving forward, I'm going to move forward. All right. I thank you for sharing. I know this is a, is a hard conversation and I thank you for sharing it. So let's talk about the path of mindful communication. So once again, I just want to bring to your, uh, in your attention this idea of intention. It was one of those pillars that we talked about, those foundational components of mindfulness. Our intention when we're talking about communication that's mindful is that what we're really trying to do is develop care and curiosity and build understanding. Like that that is the intention that we're trying to weave into our communication. And when I talk about care, it's not just about caring about what's happening externally with the other person in front of us. It's also caring about ourselves. But having a genuine curiosity to try to understand what's happening, both for them and for ourselves. So we're really trying to um, create a, a, a dialogue that is back and forth. You know, it's it's really trying to create a flow within conversation with, which honors both sides of the conversation. And the first piece of that has to do with our own embodiment, okay? So when I'm talking about embodiment, I'm talking about really being present with what's happening for us. Um, when we were just talking about the, you know, the anger or aggression that uh, we may be feeling in relationship to how people are showing up. Um, you can only know that you're feeling that based on what, how your body is responding, right? That you know anger because of how it feels in your body. You know anger because of the thoughts that you have and the emotional tone that it creates for you. So when we're developing the capacity to be mindful in our communication, one of the things we're learning how to really notice and pay attention to is how our bodies are responding. And we do this because when we're in our bodies, we are in the present moment. So if we're aware of our bodies and what we're feeling as we're in communication with somebody, we're actually in the present moment. So it's a way for us to anchor ourselves in what's happening right now. A lot of times when people are communic in communication, they're oftentimes just up in their heads, right? Thinking, processing, um, creating responses for themselves in relationship to what they're talking about with another person. They're not really in their body. They're not really paying attention to how they're responding to what's happening in the dialogue. The other thing embodiment does is it helps us to support our own self-regulation. So when we're recognizing that we're becoming um, angry, you know, when we're recognizing anger in the body, you know, we can feel that feeling and then make choices to take care of ourselves. So it may be that if a conversation is getting too intense, we're getting too angry, maybe somebody else is showing up as too aggressive or we're showing up as too aggressive, we can take measures to take care of ourselves. So that may be like ending a conversation, saying I can't talk anymore, I'm just, I'm, I'm too um, hypervigilant right now, or I just, I need a break. I need to come back to this conversation. So being in our bodies can help us to calm ourselves down, to recognize when we need to calm ourselves down. And it helps us to self-monitor in terms of how we're responding to the dialogue. So it helps us to recognize um, what thoughts are showing up, how we feel in our bodies, and the emotions that are happening. Okay, so the first thing we're, one of the things we're learning how to do and what I refer to as this dance of mindful communication is to notice what's happening for ourselves because it's providing us with information. And as I mentioned before, 
we are tapping into what we refer to as the triangle of awareness. We're paying attention to thoughts, sensations in the body, and our emotions, that these things are what we're cultivating awareness around as we're in our bodies. So uh, the practice that I want us to work with is a grounding and anchoring practice. Um, so I would like us to just take a few minutes to practice um, a grounding practice. And this is one you can do with your eyes open or your eyes closed. And the idea of doing this grounding practice is to bring your attention into the present moment. Having an anchor when, especially when dialogues are really intense and we're finding ourselves really activated around them, having a grounding practice to bring ourselves into can be really helpful in terms of keeping ourselves kind of balanced and stabilized. Um, so these are, these are things you can do in the moment that you're in communication with somebody. Okay, but we're just going to practice with them now um, a couple of different grounding practices so you can get a sense of what those feel like for you and perhaps find one that is easiest for you to anchor into. Okay, so what I'd like you to do is begin by just um, getting into a comfortable position sitting. And I, I have some um, chimes, so I'm going to kind of guide us through a little kind of mini meditation. Um, to go through these different um, sources of anchoring. And then um, if people want to talk about their experience with it, that um, we can do that as well. So I'll ring the chimes to begin and I'll ring the chimes to end. Okay, and just follow along as best you can. I'm just going to be asking you to bring some attention to different areas of your body. Okay. So if you're comfortable doing so, I'm gonna ask you to shut down your eyes or you can leave them open if you like. And I'd like you to begin by just noticing yourself sitting, whether it be on a chair or on a couch, on the floor. Just feeling the body as you sit and perhaps noticing the points of contact that your body makes with the surface beneath you, whether that be the feet making contact with the ground or the hips making contact with your chair or the floor. And I'd like you to see if you can feel into the sense of gravity in the lower areas of the body. So really feeling into the density of the hips and the legs, just allowing them to be heavy. Noticing the support of the floor beneath you. And feeling into the upper body, the drape of the arms. Allowing them to kind of hang like curtains. And just noticing the density of the body as you sit. And seeing if you can just stay with that felt sensation. Feeling gravity, feeling density in the body, the weight of the body. holding your attention there. And if you get distracted, just come back to that felt sensation of gravity. And as you're ready, I'm gonna ask you to start to bring your attention to the base of the spine, the area just below the spine called the sacrum. It sits in between the hips. And as you're ready to, bringing your attention up the spine, from the base of the spine all the way to the back of the neck, really feeling into the spinal column, seeing if you can notice the muscles along the sides of the spine. 
And we're just noticing whatever sensations are here. We're not trying to control anything. Just feeling the body, feeling into the spine. And if you're comfortable doing so, seeing if you can bring your attention internally into the midline of the body. So kind of feeling into the center of the body. In the area where the spine is, but more internal. And just being aware of that space. Noticing what's there to be felt. And as you're ready, we're going to bring our attention into some areas of the body where we tend to have a lot of um, sensory information. So I'm going to give you a few options and you just land your attention wherever it feels uh, most um, visible for you, where sensation is most um, vi visible or alive for you. So areas where we tend to have a lot of sensory input is in the palms of the hands or the bottoms of the feet or around the mouth or the orbits of the eyes. So seeing if you can find where there's a lot of sensation in any of those reference points and see if you can just bring your attention to those points of sensation. So if you notice sensory information in the palms of the hands, just resting your attention and awareness in the palms of the hands. Or perhaps feeling the bottoms of the feet or around the mouth or around the orbits of the eyes. Whatever's most accessible to you. And to the best of your ability, just allowing things to be as they are. Allowing yourself to be as you are. Just noticing what's there to be felt. And when you're ready, we're going to transition again, this time bringing our attention to the breath. Just feeling the breath moving through the body. And noticing that felt sensation of air as it comes in and goes out. Holding your attention there as best you can. And bring yourself back if you drift away. And as you're ready, we're going to transition to once again feeling the whole body sitting. Noticing points of contact with the chair or cushion beneath you, the support of the floor. And feeling the breath moving through the body. Being with things just as they are in this moment. 
and allowing yourself to be just as you are in this moment. And as you're ready, opening your eyes, reorienting yourself to the space that you're in, maybe taking a look around and naming a couple objects silently to yourself. Now I would, so the purpose of going through that whole practice, as I mentioned when we began, you know, embodiment is a kind of key way that we can stay engaged in communication. It's one of the things that we bring our orientation to when we're communicating. And these grounding or anchor points that we just went through are ways for us to maintain a sense of stability when we're in communication, especially when the stakes are high. So what I'd like to invite the group to do, who's ever open to sharing, um, if you identified one of the practices that we went through that you found particularly helpful or was most easiest for you to lean into, um, if you'd be willing to share which one it was. So we went through gravity, we went through the midline of the body, so feeling into the spine and the center of the torso. We um, paid attention to the sensory touch points of um, the hands, feet, mouth, or eyes, and then the breath. So if anybody would like to share about their experience, I'd, I'd welcome that input. You know, for me, the, the sensory perception was the easiest for me to lean into. I could feel it immediately, and I was able mm -hmm. to stick with it. Me too. Great. Great. Okay. So that's important. Like, that's something that you can hold on to. And that can be a real easy way for you if you're finding yourself caught up in thoughts, really carrying yourself away, either in conversation or just in your daily life. This is an easy and accessible, not necessarily easy, sometimes it's harder than others, but it's an accessible way for you in the moment to bring yourself back to what's right here, right now. When you're feeling what's in your body and you're tapping into that, you're in the moment because our bodies, the sensory information lives in this moment, right? Is there any other, so, so a couple of, go ahead. So then just taking a minute, closing your eyes and then going to those points and feeling the perception, right? Right, just noticing the sensation. You might notice temperature or pressure or tingling or vibration, whatever's there. Just and it can even just be 30 seconds, truly. And you can do this with your eyes open too. In fact, as you go through your day, you can just take a moment throughout your day to, I'm just gonna feel into the palms of my hands. But in moments when that are really highly stressful, you know, like when we're engaging with people and it's stressful, this is another place for you to anchor so that you don't get carried away, you know, that you don't run off into um, launching into behaviors that you may not may not want to. This is a way for you to ground yourself. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Did anybody else find another anchor that worked better for them? Gravity, the breath, the midline. The gravity and breath always help me. You know, okay. Sitting heavy and then breathing. Yeah, I'd say that invariably is yeah. one of the best techniques. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, we, we all have our own nervous systems, right? And uh, I think a lot of what we're all learning how to do is recognize when our nervous systems are activated and then responding to them. So these grounding and anchoring practices can be really helpful, helping us to regulate our nervous systems. And we're all gonna lean into different things differently. Like there are some things that are gonna resonate for some that aren't gonna resonate for others. And it's just about experimenting and exploring and finding out, figuring out what works for you. 
but it does, you know, we need to do it regularly. It needs to become a habit. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and move forward because I am I know we're running out of time. Um, so the kind of the second thing on this path of mindful communication has to do with this idea of listening. And I, I mentioned this earlier that many times when we're in dialogue with another person, we're truly not listening to them, you know? M most of the time we're caught up in how we're gonna respond to what they're saying, you know? Or we're ready to share our own perceptions about whatever's happening or whatever's being discussed without ever really, truly listening to what the other person has to say. So when we're practicing mindful communication, we're really learning how to back off from being up in our heads when we're in conversation. And when the other person has the floor, we give them, we truly give them the floor, right? So they're in the role of speaking and we're engaged in trying to understand what it is that they're sharing. And we're doing so with a sense of curiosity. curiosity. We're really, if you have your um, microphone on, if you could turn it off for me, that would be great. We're just getting a little bit of feedback. So we're genuinely trying to be interested in what's happening on the other side of the table, so to say. Um, and when we do speak within, when the person has the floor, we're speaking merely to get um, greater clarity. So we may be wanting to have a greater understanding of what a person meant when they said such and such. So that we're really giving the person the opportunity to get it all out, right? And I think the thing that we start to see when we really give ourselves permission to just sit back and listen is that what's really happening when somebody's talking to us is that they're really sharing with us their internal world. You know, there's, um, and, and the other thing we start to recognize through the process of mindful communication is just how vulnerable all of this communication is. You know, a lot of times we go through our daily lives being very casual in our communications, the things that we say and do, how much we listen, how deeply we listen. But when we really start to pay attention both to listening and speaking, we start to recognize that it can be a really emotionally intimate um, act to really listen to somebody. If you think back on your own life, and the people that really had a positive impact on you, oftentimes the things that those people are able to do for us is really hear us. There's something, we all have this fundamental need to be seen, heard, and understood. Even if what the other person is saying, we don't necessarily agree with what they're saying. But for that person to be heard and to know that we understand them can be really game-changing for people. It can really change the quality and dynamics of a relationship. So when we're, we're learning how to be more mindful in our communication, we're really, one step of that is really learning how to listen, deeply listen, and giving that person the space they need to express themselves, even if it's stuff we don't like hearing, you know? And then finally, when it's our turn to share, there's um, some, I like to think of them as kind of like gateways that we take our own communication through before we share. You know, that we become more thoughtful about how we're talking to people uh, when, we're, when, we're, when we have the floor, when we're speaking. So some gateways to consider um, before you start sharing your side or your part of the dialogue is, is what we're saying true. So, and when I say that, I'm talking about subjective truth, right? Um, what is true for us? How we see things? Um, and being really authentic and genuine. And like I said before, when we really start talking this way to people, we start to really recognize how vulnerable it is to be truly authentic and honest with people about what's happening for us. That it really is when we're really speaking honestly and truthfully with people, there is a great deal of vulnerability present. And we start to see that, especially when we start sharing for ourselves, when we're in communication. So is what we're saying true for us? Are we being truly authentic in terms of how we're representing ourselves? 
The second is, is it kind? Now we may need to say things that are hard for people to hear. It becomes even harder for people to hear things when we're harsh when we say it. So if we really want people to hear us, even when we have disappointing news to share, or we're asking people to respect our boundaries or telling people what we need, we can say what we need to say in a way that's kind. And so when we talk to people, even if what we have to say is difficult, orienting towards making the message kind so that, and this is just to increase the likelihood that they'll actually hear us. Doesn't mean they will, but there's a greater likelihood they will hear what we say if we can frame it in a way that isn't filled with judgment and hostility. The third gateway is, is it necessary? Is it relevant? Do I need to say what I'm getting ready to say? Is, is it going to be beneficial? So will what I'm saying be beneficial to this conversation? Is it necessary for me to say it in this moment? So is the time right? Right? I remember once watching um, a parent completely berate their child in public. And I just thought to myself in that moment, like how humiliating that would have been for that child, you know? And it wasn't that the parent didn't have the right to try to correct their child, but the, the time in which they did it, um, I am sure fundamentally undermined that parent-child relationship because of when they did it. And I just remember feeling so bad for that kid. And it wasn't because the parent didn't need to say it, it was when they chose to say it, because it was really socially embarrassing for that kid. Um, so we really need to be thoughtful about when we say what we need to say, so that we're positioning it in a way that isn't damaging to the relationship. And so these are just, those are kind of the primary, um ways of engaging in terms of being mindful in communication staying embodied um really deeply listening to what the other person is saying and really bringing a lot of awareness to what we say when it's our turn to say it and kind of using those gateways that i mentioned as kind of our talking points you know the things that we reflect on before we share information but there are other considerations I just wanna share with you as we wrap up our time together. Um, it is really important to consider um, in our communication with other people um, how important trust and safety are. You know, if we really want there to be transparency in our relationships, there needs to be a sense of trust and safety. And that goes both ways, right? It's not just about us showing up, it's about that other person showing up that we're more likely to have the most authentic conversations when there is trust and safety present. So we really wanna stay um, oriented towards building connection and being solution-based when we're in communication with other people. Additionally, when, when the rubber really starts to hit the road, when um, there's tension or conflict in conversation, a lot of times what people will do is speed up their communication. So people will start kind of rapid fire um, speaking. They'll start speaking really fast and people will stop listening to one another and it will be kind of this back and forth battle of words, you know? Um, and what we really want to do, even if we're just the ones leading in that moment, we really want to um, slow down when things are getting heated. It's really important to take moments to pause, to really think about what we're gonna say and to pace ourselves as we're in communication. And you can really think of this kind of as a leadership role that we're showing up and leading in moments when it starts to get really intense. And you can simply do that by slowing down the pace of the conversation. And we can simply do that by these really simple things of pausing, having moments of considering before we speak and making our pace a little bit slower. The other thing that's important is to recognize whether it's true for us or for the other person that's in the communication with us, 
is at the end of the day, we all have fundamental needs that we're trying to get met. So in the course of a conflict, um, it can be helpful to understand what our own needs are and what the needs are of the other person. What matters most to you and what matters most to them. And that leads to the next step, which is this idea of collaboration. Because oftentimes we're in communication working from a place of strategies. Like we want things to be a certain way. We want this other person to do X, Y, and Z, or we want certain things to happen. But what we wanna do is really be clear on what our needs are, because when we have a sense of what our needs are, there's lots of ways that we can potentially get our needs met. Not necessarily the specific strategies that we've lined out or the specific strategies that somebody else has lined out. And that's where collaboration comes into play, that we figure out what works for both parties. And stay with the here and now. A lot of times when there's conflict, we spend a lot of time talking about what happened in the past, what so-and-so did in the past, what I've done in the past. We really wanna talk about more about what's here right now and being specific about what's happening right now. So staying fact-based, really talking about what we're observing rather than our judgments or opinions. And I really encourage you all to consider flexing the muscles of compassion and empathy rather than aggression. There is a, um, there is a, she's a, a Zen, a teacher of Zen. Uh, her name is Joan Halifax. And she talks about this idea of strong back, uh, soft front, that many of us walk around with a strong front and a soft back, meaning that many of us walk around with this armor up in the front of ourselves. Like we really build a wall between ourselves and other people. And we're really ultimately operating from a place of fear, which is this soft, um, soft back, you know, this idea that we're protecting ourselves. Um, and what she encourages us to consider is having a strong back and a soft front, meaning metaphorically having a sense of ourselves having a sense of our integrity and our values and maintaining a sense of openness to what's happening. This idea of being compassionate and not just compassionate towards other people, but compassionate towards ourselves as well, right? To maintain a sense of kindness and friendliness to the best of our abilities and to stay grounded in our values and what's important to us. And finally, just noting that this is all just practice. You know, being a human being is incredibly messy and we're going to make mistakes. Other people are going to make mistakes. But if we want to stay aligned with our integrity and we want to learn and grow, it's important to acknowledge when we've done something wrong. You know, I cannot tell you how humbling it is for me to go to my kids and say, hmm, you know, mom didn't really handle that well. You know, I would have preferred to have shown up this way and I'll, I'll try to do better in the future. You know, um, that is an incredibly hum humbling act for me as a parent, but I know that it builds a better connection with my children and that my children see me as human. You know, that I'm, I'm fallible too, but I'm learning and growing just like they are, right? So those are just some final thoughts I wanna share as we conclude. And this, these, these resources will be in your packet for this evening. Um, there are a few books. The first one, How to Talk So Kids Will Listen, and or How to Talk So Kids Will Listen and Listen So Kids Will Talk. That's for the parents who might be showing up tonight. And then the other books are just ways for you to kind of gain a greater understanding of um, mindful communication and what that might look like for you. So that's all I have for this evening. Mike, did you want to share any final thoughts? I'm not yes. sharing my. No, absolutely. Amy, thanks so much. Appreciate you very much. This is fantastic. Everyone, thanks for your attendance. I hope you got a lot out of it. You know, I know I did. Every time I interact with Amy or sit in her classes, you know, I always, always, I always learn something that I can immediately apply to my life, especially with my kids. <laughs> no, but uh, <laughs> sign up for future webinars. Get on our website, right? Or sent.org. Look at the webinars tab and 
we've got, you know, I think seven more sessions, if I'm not mistaken, with Amy. So if you got a lot out of today, there's more in store. Please also spread the word to your your friends. So this is, you know, for the worst sent community. But then, you know, it, it's open to everyone writ large. Anybody that could benefit from mindfulness in their life, you know, and stress reduction, which I think is pretty much everyone on this earth. Right, so right. We've got the webinars to accommodate, you know, the masses. So there it is. Lastly, at the end of this, you'll receive a survey. And I'd ask you just take a couple minutes to say, hey, was it good? Did you get something out of it? And any tips or pointers, um, you know, in terms of what would make it even better? Because we always want to be a learning organization and be as good as we can be. So take that time, uh, give us that feedback so that we can continue to, you know, produce some great webinars that are of value to everybody. And uh, I think that's, that is it. So stay safe, everybody. Amy, can I just say, parting words, please. Can I say I'll one be, more thing? Absolutely. Okay. So I just wanted to say to everybody, since we had about over half of the audience here tonight, um, who, who indicated that they weren't currently um, practicing mindfulness meditation in their daily lives. I do want to let you know that next week is the beginning of a four-week series uh, called Foundations of Mindfulness. So for over the course of four weeks, we'll be spending about an hour each, uh, each Wednesday at 7 p.m. learning a new component of mindfulness. Um, so I highly encourage, especially those of you that don't have a current